Peter. Peter is from Bern University, and he works in, a, in the Institute for Bee Health, and that is really my kind of institute. So can I hand you over to Peter? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's, it's my true pleasure to be here. And um, actually, there's one particular reason. You know, I, speak, I think I speak in the name of, of Jared and Tom and myself. We were writing our papers. We were like truly delighted that actually someone is reading them. <laughs> and on top of that, when, when those papers actually have an impact in the real world, that is even more amazing. That is really cool. So when we have like some you know, outreach outside of the ivory tower, that is always right, for us very, very thrilling or it's like very motivating. So thank you very much for taking for taking us into consideration. And I'll, well, basically, I was really delighted to say that you know many people here, the, well, you actually, you're I think you're on the right track. So this is I think the real way forward for, for keeping base. And the aim of my talk is to give you a bit of a of a background. I think why I believe you're doing the right thing, maybe giving a bit of inspiration. And. Having like the audience over here, so the first slide of mine is a bit off topic. I apologize for that one here. Here we go. We have here a honeybee and a polar bear, and at the first slide, they have really nothing to do with each other. However, if you give it a fat and thought, it may be the case. Why? You know, polar bears are fluffy, you know, Knut, the famous one from the yeah. zoo, and they are so cute and and they are so endangered because they have, you know, because of global warming, you know, they have not enough food. And people are really worried about polar bears and how to save the polar bears. Well, okay, so much so good. There are tens of thousands of species up there in the Arctic regions. No one actually cares. That's from, from, from whatever special fish adapted to cold conditions and so on and so on. So I think it's actually good that people are worried about polar bears because by worrying about the polar bears, we're doing probably a lot of good things for all the other species, which we totally ignore or not aware of. Them. So the honeybees are the polar bears of the insects. So really to say that as long as there will be beekeepers, there will be managed honeybees full stop. So we talk here, we have real problems, otherwise we wouldn't discuss about that surely, but we talk about high-end problems. I personally believe the real issues are for bumblebees, solitary bees, overflies, butterflies, mm -hmm. all those creatures who don't have keepers to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So please take that into account. We, our problems are high end. I think the real bad thing is the insects we don't care about. All right, sorry, a bit of off topic, but I thought that's the right audience to say that. <laughs> Good. Coming back to the main issue here, that's, that's you know this famous person Charles Darwin had a couple of really great ideas, and natural selection is I think is one of the few fundamental principles in biology. It's real. It's happening. Has a major impact. Natural selection has shaped us. Has shaped the entire environment. It also holds true for laser pointers and cell phones. You can apply the very same principles. But what is the background? Is that okay here? Okay. Your hearing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like this better, hopefully, yeah, okay. Good, my name is always the same. Good, here we go. Just the same. Good, it's past. No, no, I take them off, that's okay. All right, better now? Still? Good. Perfect? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Well done. All right, natural selection. Are well, we having here a population of whatever? Bees, cell phones, everything, and here we have a time. And you're having those brown ones over here, they have a high reproductive success due to heritable traits, meaning genetics, you know, a trait is going from the mother to the offspring, from the father to the offspring. And now we're looking in time, and here we go, ta-ta, the brown points dominate in the population because these traits are really beneficial for that. That is basically the underlying fundamental mechanism changes in populations in time. And this is not fancy theory, I told you. It is happening all around us. We tend to ignore us. Natural selection holds true for us and for all on the planet. And one thing which is, I think, really serious is antibiotics resistance of bacteria. Due to misusage of bacteria, whenever you have a running nose, take an antibiotic. It will fix it. No, it will not. If you have a virus, the antibiotic is utterly useless. So people are 
using antibiotics, uh, feeding antibiotics tens of tons of thousands to, to healthy uh, cattle, a healthy livestock. So we will have a return of the serious bacterial diseases soon. So take propolis, take them into account. Yeah. So this, uh, this is real, and it, it can create real world problems. So yeah, antibiotic resistance is something serious. So adaptation. So the bacteria adapt. In this case, they have a very severe selection pressure acting on the bacteria. That's the antibiotic. So of course, you can only survive, you can only reproduce if you can cope with that antibiotic. That's a very strong force. So that's an adaptation. The evolution of a particular expression of a trait in this case, you know, survival of the antibiotics, because it enhances fitness. Ooh, what is fitness? Fitness is when you run in the morning before the conference starts for half an hour. No, it's not. But, so what is fitness? So let's take an example. What is the fitness of honeybee colony? Good. So it's a relative lifelong reproductive success. You know, how well is, you know, remember the brown dots? You know, this colony is some brown dots. So relative lifelong success. What is it? Higher fitness can be due to survival rates. Makes perfect sense. If you die, in this case, here's a dead colony in Switzerland, or here, a happy colony in China. If you die very early, you have less offspring. Very clear. Mating success. Club. If you're, if the queens, or if drones here are mating, lots of them are mating, you have a higher fitness. So that's also obvious. Number of offspring. So in the honeybee, the honeybee is, is, is reproducing with swarming, so the number of swarms produced is a swarm here in southern Africa, settling in the tree, number of swarms produced. Then, the offspring has to survive. So there are very good data here from the United States, from Tom and others, that survival of the swarms is actually not as high as you think, maybe 15, 20% or something under natural conditions. And so the number of the swarms have to survive. Then also like, come on, we are the social insects, and Charles Darwin in the first place, had a real issue believing, hey, are these social insects totally fatal to my theory? Because like all the workers don't reproduce, exception of laying workers, you may know that, yeah. And, but so what is it is it, is it, is it, is it a problem? Because only the queen bee is actually reproducing and laying eggs. No, it's not. Because survival and reproduction of relatives is an important point, because the workers share a lot of the genes with the queen. So for the workers, it's really adaptive helping their mother to rear sisters and brothers. So this is an important issue, especially here for understanding why we have the social insects in the first place. Good, so far so good. Good, so all right, here we're having now again the colony. So we're having a female part of reproduction, that's the number of swarms produced. And we have the male part, so every drone mating is good. So we have the number of surviving swarms, or if you split the colony in spring timely, is a female fitness, and the number of successfully mating male drones is a male fitness. Everything else we look at is just, so is my English, hopefully correct term, tokens of fitness. Something which you can say, but it's not the real thing. The real things, swarms and drones mating. That's it. And drones, you know, are analogous to a colony testers. If you look at the colony as a functional unit, then the drones, sorry guys in the audience, they are nothing else than flying sperm. <laughs> and the number of drones produced that is the testers of the colony. <laughs> and what about these colonies? Those colonies which are doing really good in a certain environment can cope with a lot of stressors, including us. Eh? So they can produce more swarms than drones. That's basically the framework of honeybee fitness. <coughs> all right, so you may argue, okay, Peter, you're talking a lot of nonsense over here. All these ivory tower stuff, so come on, who cares? So why can that be relevant, or is it just, you know, ivory tower of university. Good, <laughs> let's have a look. Though this is a picture you don't want to say. This is like, you know, dead colonies in Switzerland. We have a, it's a very nice, I don't know the English word, Hinterbehandlungsbeuten, <laughs> you work from the back. And it's, yeah, it's a bit tricky, but as it's nevertheless lovely. So that's it's less lovely. And, you know, we know since, since you know, the, the headline of the New York Times, the bees vanish and scientists race for reasons, that headline did change my entire life. Working for many years with honeybee diseases, you know, I was in the beginning, people told me, Peter, you're wasting your time. It's nonsense. Who cares about bee disease? Forget it. So that headline really changed it because there's a lot of public awareness, not only amongst beekeepers, but also the general public. If I have a bear in a pub in Berlin, people say, oh, you work on honeybee disease. So interesting. Yeah, okay. That's so different from what it was being like many years ago. 
All right, good. So much about public attention. So within the Colors Network, and the large network of researchers globally, we want to, you know, we are interested in improving the well-being of honeybees. So we have now very clear comparable and standardized data. So that is solid data that we have elevated losses of honeybee colonies <coughs> over ten percent. There are very few things you can say about the data in terms of interpretation. There's one thing that's very sure: the data are uh, the losses are highly variable in space and time. So in one country, 3%, 5%, next year, 20% and even more. So there is variation, and to be honest, we don't really know why there is so much variation going on. So there's really effort, need for more research. So why are colonies dying? That's an obvious question emerging if you see those pictures. All of you know the usual suspects. Here we go. So we're having lots of factors for managed honeybee health. They all can act singly. You know, no food, pesticides, pathogens, varroa, here's a queen of problems together with viruses. You have genetic diversity, inbreeding an issue. All these factors can kill colonies and they can also act together. There has been a lot of work being done in the past trying to understand better the mechanisms why those factors can kill colonies. Colonies are very well adapted and they are buffered systems. But a colony is dying is actually some, well, some issue. And one factor which has been safely ignored is us. <laughs> so, sorry, who is the worst enemy of bees? No, I don't want to answer the question yet. But I think you can, we can do a lot of things really utterly wrong with the bees. With any livestock, you can do things wrong. And so that emerged only over the past years, maybe case that, you know, we could change species. So I would suggest the Darwin Hospital for Honey Bays. So if you take into account, you know, ideas originally emerging from Charles Darwin and the principles of natural selection evolution, so how can we take advantage of those to improve the health of honey bays? And here's like the apiaries, <coughs> the patients, diagnostics, treatment prevention, and executive board, like a normal hospital. Okay, all right. First, imports of bees interfere with local adaptation. I want to give you a very extreme example. It's always good to have extreme examples. Here we go. There's a lot of queen rearing going on, on in Sicily. Sicily, you know, uh, who has been to Sicily? Sicily, in June, July, and August, Sicily is super dry, extremely dry. There is almost nothing flowering. In August, September, they have a kind of a second spring, and the colonies are going on. In that time period, colonies cease brood rearing. There's nothing to forage on, so they can't rear any brood. Good. In Finland, it's exactly the opposite. June, July, August are the only months that the bees have any food because there's winter, you have snowstorm in September already. So if you have any, any local adaptations of the bees to Sicily, if you bring those bees to Finland, they're utterly useless, they're totally out of place. Mm. So this is an extreme example, but there are now we have some indications, actually work from Tier that you know, maybe 30 kilometers are already sufficient to make a difference. So please take it into account. <coughs> Imports from other countries or across the continent, I think, are, sorry, total nonsense. Good. Then a low swarming tendency that limits the female, fact, the female fitness. There's an important part to swarms. So if we go in for that one, we negate that female part, obviously. Drone brood removal negates female fitness. <coughs> Myself, you know, I'm guilty. You know, when I started to, to do uh, extension work with the beekeepers, I told them, hey, cut out the drone brood. And that was for a reason, because, you know, the drone brood, you cut out a lot of mites, so you have an effect. But that doesn't have really have an effect. The drone brood is attractive, so you cut out the drone brood, you cut out quite a bit of mites. Fewer mites is very good, certainly. But what is really bad, you're castrating colonies. You do castrate a colony. So the male fitness is totally eliminated if you remove all the drones. So ooh, that is a very high price you have to pay for that. Prevention of swarming without splitting, that's the whole point over here. So that is, we may simply kill colonies by not allowing them to swarm. You know, the principle of artificial swarming, everybody knows. That has been done, and it can be extremely helpful. So if we prevent, limit the swarming, we may actually kill the colonies. Removal of propolis limits social immunity. That is like something like, you know, when you play chess, you know, F1, G3, or E2, E4, 
you know, you're moving like the first important thing. So when I used to open up a colony, I took my half to and to removed all the scrappy propolis on top. That looks bad, you know, come on. It's much more aesthetic than if you had me clean. <laughs> all right, sure, I did that myself. Again, guilty, yeah. But it's, de it's definitely pretty stupid because, you know, this stuff here is collected for a reason. Tom has shown a beautiful picture of a propolis and, and the hind leg of a bay. It takes them such an effort to get rid of the stinky stuff in the colony. And actually, you can do a little experiment. You put a frame of honey on a table in a garden, and all the bees will come and collect the honey quickly. But if you're patient and all the honey has gone, you can see a very few workers collecting the propolis on the frames. It's the only occasion. You can actually almost never see it elsewhere. But put a frame on a table and watch. Be patient. You can see those. So, and this is quite important because propolis really is known to have antivirant, anti antibacterial properties. It is helpful. It did help me in Africa. No doctor, you take the propolis, it helps. And bees also use it as a therapy. So there's evidence out when bees are sick. There's another paper I ignored here, sorry. So their bees are using, uh, they shift their, their, the propolis foraging as an adaptive response to a disease, which I think is amazing, the self-medication. We know for a number of other animals, like primates, for example, they eat certain food when they are sick. And so yeah, don't remove the propolis. That is something I can highly recommend. <coughs> something else, which may be a bit bizarre in the beginning, when we enforce the queens, we may have unhappy peasants. Hmm. Why is that the case? OK, right, good. Trying a bit like starting from Adam and Eve. We have the honeybee mating system. So the queen is mating up in the air. She's mating with one male, and the others are patiently waiting. And then there is another male coming. And I did my PhD on honeybee mating. So queen bees mate between 1 and 49 times. So depending on the area, <coughs> average is maybe 15, 16 times. And so as a result of that, when you look at the colony, the bees look for us all the same. Queens, drones, of course, the workers look all the same, the young ones a bit fluffy, and the old ones without hair, but otherwise they look pretty much the same. But in, in reality, there is a very colorful mixture of bees in every colony we have, because the workers have very different drone fibers. Every worker is it's a big family, but it's very colorful. Lots and lots and lots of males have contributed here. The bees are very diverse, and that has has, uh, so there's very diverse, lots of families, and that has important consequences. <coughs> Sorry, if we're having the consequences of genetic diversity, there's very good evidence that the bees of the different subfamilies are more likely to do certain tasks. I explained that. I used to live when I was a student. I lived together with eight other people in the digs, yeah, and you know when there was one or two bottles in the a, in a dish. I didn't do the dishwashing. I only wrapped it when there were no bottles anymore in the cupboard. But you know, some of the people in my, in my digs had another you know, kind of attitude. So they did all the, uh, all the glasses. So I never had the pleasure to do the washing in the digs. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you're, doing, if you're doing a certain task very often, you become very good in it because you're just a professional. If you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, you're doing it very good. And that holds true here. We have good evidence here for pollen foraging, undertaking, guard bees, and also here over for the royalists. So we're having different thresholds to our tasks. And then the royalists, that is something, there's another paper from the Ben Audrey Group in Australia. And there is a tragedy of the honeybee royals. I would like to explain to you the tragedy of the honeybee royals. These subfamilies, the data from two studies independent show, they are very rare in the workforce, but they are much more common, or they are, they are significantly more common in the queens. So they have a very predisposition, so that when the, when the workers choose larvae for queen rearing, it's not random. The workers use cues we have no idea about, and they're more attractive to become queens. So when we choose larvae, you know, these nice Chinese grafting tools, yeah, we do that, yeah. So then we use, we look at the right age, but that's it. We have no idea what the cues are of the bees to choose their next mother. And if there's any decision which is quite important for the fate of the entire colony, is who is going to be the queen next time. So we just ignore that. So here, come on, that is like something, you know, <laughs> having the next queen is very important and to be happy with the next queen, not only in the Netherlands, but actually globally, actually. All right, here we go. So um, now we're having the queens clarified, and now we're having the interference with the mating system. I told you already. 
is that queens, <coughs> honeybees in general, put a lot of effort into having a very high genetic diversity. And um, we are really, here at the mating stations, we use that. That's no good. Also, like, we're replacing queens annually, and that, like, Rutin, I said, always recommended to replace queens. And, you know, transmission via queens can make pathogens less severe. And I don't have the time to go into the details, so please trust me. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's good evidence, you know, that, that for a varroa and deformed wing virus, that varroa has changed the rules for viruses in the way. Good. So, all right. At the end of the day, there might be these impossible trade-offs. So, we, well, some of us, are very interested in honey yield and low swarming tendency and very peaceful bees. So we may have to pay a price for that. <coughs> so maybe always like kind of like, for example, African bees are certainly not peaceful, but they're very healthy. So there may be trade-offs. <coughs> Excuse me. So going on to the Darwin Hospital, you can still argue, hey, come on, Peter, it's still not relevant for us. So what can we really do? Go still back to the ivory tower. So what we have, I have a top 10 list I would like to recommend. Think globally, really, take into account experiences. Here are people from 30 countries, that's a good example. Connect, think globally, but breed locally. Use your local base, <laughs> really do that. Then, you know, don't select for low swarming tendency because then it's important for female fitness. Don't castrate colonies. Let them make drones and let the drones make. That's so important. Then, time you split your colonies in spring. Here, well, a great colony. But this is a Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> It's a real, we are creating monsters. Such a colony will never, ever be nat naturally occurred. The colony would have swarmed many times already. That is totally unnatural. That will never happen. Really. That is recreating monsters if we keep colonies big like this. Don't remove populace. Obvious, yeah. It may look not so nice when you open the colony, but it's very healthy for the bees. And, you know, well, that's pretty clear. And should good, sufficient, and timely food, especially, well, pollen or autumn, like, if you want to have really proper, good winter bees, pollen in autumn is quite efficient, uh, important when the bees are rearing those bees. Let the bees choose their own queens. You know, the unhappy peasants. Free love. Let the queens mate at their own apiary. You don't put them on an island far away where there are very few males to have. Let them mate with the drones from the neighboring colonies because those colonies have, you know, done well in the surviving. Other they would have produced so many drones that your queen have a chance to mate with those males. And don't replace the queens prophylactically. I was saying that's probably not a very good idea. So this is my other last point is, you know, just think like a bee. You know, take into, you know, you know, you know, honey and pollination is the one issue, but trying to understand, use bee empathy. What is good for the bees? Try to think like a colony, like a colony unit. What is good for the colony? And it will be helpful for the health and well-being of your bees, I'm sure. So what is the Thai health message? It is. First of all, natural selection is relevant for managed honeybee health, and we have not taken that serious for many years. Um, I believe that you know, sustainable beekeeping can only be achieved if you take advantage of natural selection. I hope I could explain to you that there are many reasons to see, hey, that does have an impact. Let's use it for us to make our life easier and to make the bees more healthy. And yes, you can do it. It's nothing fancy. There's very simple measures you all can do, and also like you can ask Tiat and Tom, and there's ex experience around there how to do it. There are successful examples all over the planet. Just go for it, do it now. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. I'm a PhD student and I'm working with Peter um, Imber. And <coughs> what we are trying to do as a colleague, so as a, uh, globally, um, with, the, with our research on, on bees, on health bees, on, on bee health, we are trying to um, create a map of what are the survivors of, um, what are the where are the population of, of, of Abyss mellifera that are indeed surviving for the structure. And as you already know by the example of uh, Tom, there are indeed different populations that are surviving, that not, now we know that are confirmed that are surviving uh, by other structure infestation for more, even for more than 10 years without any mind treatments. But the, the things that it seems that there are more 
than the one that uh, have been until now confirmed. So what we are trying to do as a Colos Association is try to build um, a map indeed, um, try to gain uh, as many data as possible about these colonies. Because we, as, as a scientist, we are just, you know, closing our lab, we, we don't know, we are really focused on our work, but we don't know how indeed the situation is. So we, uh, we, we create this survey online. This is really a really easy tool to use. Uh, it takes five minutes, less than five minutes, really. And um, you just go on the internet and you, com you, you fill basically the survey and then we will, um, we will uh, have the result of this survey. The survey is totally anonymous, okay? So the idea is that by using this link, um, if, you, if you can take a, a picture of it, yeah, uh, I know. Yes, oh, okay, so that, that was a tree, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Quite firm in a good way. By the way, um, at the end, if, yeah, no, no, you just, you just uh, copy and paste this. But I'll tell, I'll tell you what, we, we have a Slack group, and I'll put it on the Slack yeah. group later, yes. okay? Yeah. Very good. The idea is that we, after that, we, or maybe at the end of the conference, we will, uh, if you're okay with you, we will use the, the email address, and then we will send this survey through the email address, so you get it directly. But the idea is that you, um, you go into this um, to this website and you fill the the, uh, the survey. In this way, uh, we will ask you a specific question um, about the location of these colonies, uh, how much, how many colonies are in this in this location, indeed. and and then if they are wild or there are many colonies, so if they are from a beekeeper that doesn't doesn't treat, or if they are indeed wild. Um, it takes again three minutes. It's totally anonymous. And yeah, a quick note: we are interested in Apis mellifera, so about like Africanized honeybees. Uh, we are really, indeed, we are not interested in that. But we are really interested specifically in European subspecies of mm -hmm. you know, Apis mellifera. And that's it. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you very much. Please go ahead. Yeah, gentlemen, go ahead. Please. Uh, yes, you you showed how uh, genetic diversity relates to potentially the roles inside the hive. Yes. I remember reading in Jürgen Tal's book the about mm -hmm. the bees. He relates like the roles to development, to temperature development of of larvae. How do you do these two relate? Yeah, the the, the, in, in yeah, the, the, well, the question is, well, I showed genetic diversity and as a potential basis for, for task, uh, task division, uh, for politism and the honeybee. And the gentleman mentioned that your task did some <coughs> investigations on brute temperature. Yes. Both is probably correct. The, the picture is unfortunately not as simple as we want it. Yeah. So there are many different reasons why bees are certain, doing certain tasks. For example, it's age-related division of labor. You know, all of you know that. Young bees are nurse bees, the older ones are foraging. Then the temperature where the bees are reared, there's evidence from your towns. There's solid evidence for many groups that specific subfamilies, bees from specific subfamilies, do certain things. They are more likely to do it. Bees are super flexible. All of us know winter bees in, in spring, they activate the <coughs> plants again, they reproduce. If you remove the old bees, the young bees start foraging premature. And also, like if you remove all the young bees, the old bees can even lay eggs and go when you remove all the, you have only old bees together and there's no other chance, no creamery, they start activating ovaries and becoming mm -hmm. workers. There is an enormous degree of flexibility because rule number one is long with the colony. The colony must be extremely buffered, extremely good. So all these mechanisms act together to give a complex picture of division of labor in the colony. You're welcome. Um, well, there are. F f well, yeah, gentlemen, over there, please go ahead. You said about swarming, we should be doing splits every year. Yes. In, in UK, the <laughs> climate is very changeable, and, some, and my bees are local bees, and they're yeah. not managed, and they're not managed in any way, and they're not yeah. treated. They don't swarm every year, and they produce honey in the second and third year, and maybe they'll swarm. Yeah. So, so, sorry, maybe, maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. The colonies will give you clear signals. We are ready. 
queen cells, what have you. Don't split cornies if they don't, if someone's ready to do so. Mm -hmm. Only if the corny, well, or let them, let them swarm if they want to. But, 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 but I think splitting them, the, the corny, when it's not ready to be split, is, is pointless. Mm -hmm. So, of course, like, look at what the corny is telling you. So, there's communication between the other colonies. So, only do it, of course, when the colony is ready. colony that's ready to split may well have already produced enough honey to give the beekeeper some surplus. That's also. So yeah, if you want to take honey, take the honey. Yeah, but though I mean, the point is yeah. only splitting when the colony is ready to be split. And strong. And it's, of course, strong yeah. enough. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. In nature, they wouldn't swarm if they're strong enough. So, yeah, sorry I didn't take that. Only when the colony is ready to. Um, Sorry, please. You're, Why would you split them if they're going to swarm anyway? Because you I would like I would to split them if I want to if I want to keep them. You know, if I have a strong colony and you know I see well queen cells are going on, clear signs the colony will swarm in the next days, I'm going to split them because I want to keep my bees. If of course you can also let them go. And now you're telling us, I, I just, I... Sorry, my baby didn't get it. Please I'm repeat it. I'm trying to be obnoxious, but I don't understand it. To start by saying, um, the way we are keeping bees, the way bees are being kept, yeah. is one of the Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. So yeah. So <laughs> yeah, because you want to, you, you want to, you want to. Um, basically, all right. I, I try to make a couple of suggestions, what I think may make sense, and but I want, don't want to lose my bees. If I have a very good colony, a strong colony, which is whatever, and it's ready to swarm, I say, hey, these ladies are doing extremely well. I want to, be, I want to keep them because I keep bees. <clears throat> if you, if you're happy to send the bees out to the environment, that's okay. <clears throat> that, sorry, that's a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. I would personally rather split the colony to keep all of my bees with me, but that's a matter of taste. Please, the lady over there in the back. <clears throat> that's you, yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah, we can see that with the size of the colony and when they make swarm cells. Now that doesn't matter. There are enough bees. It doesn't matter. So this, these spells really, that's, that's also the beauty. Okay, the question is uh, how I decide which bees to split and, and which bees go with the swarm or which go home. Sorry, well, that's a question. Yes. The bees that are most genetically suited to swarm and are ready to swarm. Oh no, there's there's no difference. So there is there is no significant differences in the subfamilies between the ones which swarmed and the ones which remain. That has been a study by Per Kruger and co-workers in 2004, I believe. So because there should be, um, there is some some theoretical background that you know some workers should go with the old queen and some should remain. Forget it, because uh, you know basically there is a bit of conflict in the colony. But this is. Totally, the, the colony interest is colony, totally overriding any individual interest over here. So the bees are randomly happy to go with the old queen and the others as long as they can fly and are old enough to do so. You're putting your interest ahead of the bees. You want to keep the bees. I, I think. Yeah, so that is, well, you can, it doesn't matter if we. If, I, I don't want one person okay. to Sorry. take all the questions, I'm afraid. It, but doesn't, it doesn't matter whether they naturally swarm when you split them. There is a random distribution of bees or some top families between the two units. Um, whether you split them or they naturally swarm, that doesn't matter. Can I just interject here? <coughs> we've got dozens of hands up, but we've got time for just one more question. Can I recommend you totally bombard Peter? <laughs> After he gets off the stage, question, no problem. because I know he will. Know he will Easy, no problem. So, would you like to just pick one more question? Ooh, my <laughs> duty. <laughs> and uh, please, right, make sure you're there. Please go ahead. I'm going to. Whoever, yeah, you go ahead. Or whatever. One of. Okay. Go ahead, please. As, as your position as the B doctor, and what know. you were saying yeah. about feeding antibiotics to somebody who's really got a virus and it doesn't do any good whatsoever. Yeah. After yesterday's talk, which as we all know was what it was, <laughs> I've just been doing a casual, hey, what are you doing, survey of many of the Europeans that I've met here who are fabulous people and I love each and every one yeah. of them dearly. They all treat their bees. I was a little shocked at that, as we already know, because I keep African wild bees and Varroa dust do whatever. Yeah, we already know about that. But here's my question, really. Your position as a doctor, from what I understand, they're required, it's mandatory, from what I've heard from them, yeah. it's required for them by law to treat their yes. bees. Yes. They've got to do it. Exactly. It is. 
holds true for I know. Just to repeat the question for the people on the back. All right, sorry. The question was, it is mandatory to treat against disease in certain countries by law. You have to do it, otherwise it's illegal. So what do I say to that? I think I already gave a recommendation. I certainly do not tell you to do illegal things. That's your responsibility, not mine. I'm totally innocent with regard. Okay? The point is, we must have enough evidence. We have must to show that bees can survive for hours without treatments. And then we need to go the official ways of changing the policies. That's the only way to do that. We work together, and you, know, you help also us to generate data, to write papers, and to convince people that you should change the legislation. That's the only way. I, I'm not allowed, actually, I'm in problems if I recommend yeah. things no, like I, illegal things. I don't do that. Something. So that's the only way. <coughs> we need to address the official stakeholders trying to change the law. That's the point. Yeah. Right. Okay, right. Thank you.